Hi everyone, thank you for tuning into the JPS fundraiser live stream. This is a quick reminder for you to click the link in our description box below and donate to our COVID-19 crowdfunding campaign in association with Give India, Uplift and Ujala Foundation. A recent graduate of the Sri Ram School Aravli 2020 and gap year student at Stanford University 2025, Shada Sina has an absolute stellar profile. From winning the Pradhan Mantri Bal Shakti Puraskar to find founding sleep deprived dreamers, he now focuses more on creating content for his YouTube channel. Hello, Shaurya. We're glad to have you here. Hi, thank you so much. And it is an absolute pleasure to be here. And yes, everybody, please donate. This is a great cause uh, and exactly why I'm doing it. So uh, our first question to you is, how has your gap year been so far? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think initially my gap year was, was quite difficult because as a high school student, you're used to a lot of structure in your life and you're used to your entire timetable being filled and you're used to having a certain set of goals, whether that's getting into college or that's passing an entrance examination. But in your gap year, you're really left with no accountability and like literally 24 hours in your day to do whatever you want. And in the beginning, while that can seem quite crippling, it ended up being really liberating because for the first time in my life, I didn't have to worry about what anybody was you know, going to say about what I'm doing and I could use my time the way I wanted to, which is something I personally believed in high school as well, but I could take it to another extent. Like I didn't have to give any final exams. I didn't have to do any homework. So I think channeling all of my energy into the things that I love doing, like filmmaking and creating content on YouTube, like being an entrepreneur with Sleep Tribe Dreamers, that has taught me a lot more. And I think that now that I've done those things, I will be able to use Stanford University's resources in a lot more efficient way. And I think a lot of the, the soul searching and the exploration that I would have done at Stanford and spent probably a whole year doing at Stanford, maybe even longer at Stanford, because you're still balancing other things at Stanford. Uh, I've managed to do in these 12 months. Well, it's nine months, but I have about three months left, which is crazy to me. I don't know how my gap year has gone by so quick. So I have a follow up. Uh, if like COVID hadn't happened and the situation was all fine, would you have not taken the gap year at all? Oh, 100%. I was not intending on taking this gap year. Like I I had a very, like I would say, right, typically Indian mindset when it came to taking a gap in the sense that why take a break when you don't need one? Um, if it isn't broken, don't fix it. But then I took the gap year and I looked back on it and I realized that the way we look at it is completely warped. And I think that in my opinion, every high school student, student should take a gap year. And okay, that, that's a little biased, obviously, because of my experience, but most high school students should at least think about taking a gap year. Uh, and the reason for that is because a lot of times you think that high school adequately prepares you for college. That is completely incorrect. You're living by yourself. You're doing your own finances. Uh, you're trying to work in academic majors that you've never studied in high school. Like, have you ever done philosophy in high school? Maybe IB student, but as an ISC student, it was not the case. Uh, so I think that, you know, for that, for those exploratory purposes, it was quite helpful. And also like really innocent things like making scrambled eggs, innocent for lack of a better word. I was completely incompetent. I think I would honestly die if I left, I was left to fend for myself. Like I've grown up very sheltered and I think a lot of high school students grow up in a bubble. Uh, so I think a gap year really throws you out into the world and expects you to grow up and mature. And I think the personality development I've had had in the past year has been much more compared to the last four years of high school. Um, but as for if anybody else to take a gap year, I think if you're the kind of person to take initiative and you want to do something with your time, then the gap year is a perfect opportunity for you. Uh, whereas if you think that the large amount of time is, is more intimidating than an opportunity, then I would say that you should reconsider it uh, and think more deeply about it. That actually makes a lot of sense. I think uh, just having that independence and trying to fend for yourself in that one year prepares you really well. So uh, one question that I think I can relate a lot with would be balancing your academics and extracurriculars. I'm not good at that. I can't do 10 things at the same time, I think so. But you founded a startup at 15. You started volunteering. You started your YouTube channel, your extracurriculars. And I'm sure you took out time for your personal interests also jogging, doing that 100 kilometers thing and whatnot. So how do you basically manage your time so well? And what are a few tips you can give other people to do, do the same? Definitely. I think, so the first tip I would give is that in high school, if you choose to do the things you actually like doing, 
time management becomes a lot easier because if you look at your extracurriculars as work and then you take time away from that work to have a break and then you take time away from all of that to study you're juggling like three different things which is going to be quite unsustainable in the future and then obviously you have your friends you have relationships you have you know family time etc etc so the the first thing that i made sure i did in high school was that whatever i did i made sure i enjoyed doing and obviously that's not something that just comes like that it it started with volunteering it started with filmmaking and then eventually turned into on entrepreneurship so i'd say that my my biggest piece of advice is sample as many things as you can early on because only when you start sampling different things will you realize oh i don't like something versus i like something as students were a lot better at saying oh no that sucks like i cannot do that versus being this is the one thing i'm going to do for the rest of my life because that's a very pressurizing statement like oh what are you going to do for the rest of your life oh what is this one passion that you have you can have multiple passions in multiple different fields um so i think that that's an that's the core of time management doing things you like because my fundamental belief is if you like something enough you're going to make the time for it and it's not going to feel like a burden to you uh, whether that's your best friend's relationship whether that is my work with spectaverse whether that is uh, taking time out to eat food like you will make time for things that are essential to you and i think we do that every day but most of the time it's just subconscious so we don't really realize uh, but yeah yeah i totally agree to uh, to that like it's all about priorities if you really are liking something then you will do it so it has been over an year since your first youtube video first of all congratulations for that uh, we have all seen you change from a terrified high school senior waiting for college decisions to a very successful and indeed popular stanford student how do you think being a youtuber has contributed to your personal and professional growth yeah that's such a great question uh well like norm sita there's usually like a camera in my background like almost 90% of the time like there's a camera to the left of me right now like i just walk around with a camera to be quite honest with you not because i'm self obsessed but because i just love creating stories uh and i like capturing you know experiences around me so i think youtube was initially just like a dream job because i fundamentally love storytelling i study storytelling i consume content all the time whether that's watching movies whether that's now reading books never read books before that honest confession but yeah i love stories and i also love seeing how stories can influence people and impact people and that also funnels into why i love psychology so much and why i got in, into stanford for psychology because i've always wanted to know what can be the one piece of you know information that could motivate somebody but at the same time what stops people from chasing their biggest dreams like there's so many things in our world that are fueled by human psychology and i think you know with the rise of ai and computer science while those are really really important fields uh, it becomes even more important to understand how people will use them and what fuels people so that's why youtube initially was just like a dream come true because i could literally make films uh make some form of revenue although to be quite honest with you it's really terrible youtube is exploiting creators so hard but on the other hand it's just it's it's just the dream and then also on the other side of things uh very obviously it made my communication skills a lot better because imagine sitting in front of a camera talking for 50 minutes straight every single day it's bound to sharpen those skills so i think that and this is advice for high school students as well people tell you too often to make your weaknesses less less prominent i say you should focus on your strengths i knew my strength was communication going into high school i just had a lot of experience with it so i think that if i, I had that strength why not use my gap to make that strength as spiky or as prominent as possible uh, and you know another thing youtube does that's really interesting is that uh, it just gets you to slowly detach from the numbers i think one thing that i used to do in high school i'm still guilty of it but i but people do this a lot as you evaluate your self worth on the basis of what you've done at the end of each day so if, at the end of one day if you've done nothing you feel terrible about yourself but at the end of like maybe a week where you've done a lot of stuff you feel great about yourself and that just shows we have a really terrible correlation between our productivity on one day and how we see ourselves and i think that's completely wrong it's completely toxic so in youtube as a parallel whenever i see a video that's not doing well or that gets terrible views uh i used to feel quite bad about myself and i'd be like oh my god that's reflective of how much effort i put into the video but after a point in time i've learned to detach from those numbers and i think that today it's youtube views tomorrow it can be marks i get on a paper or it can be how many internships i successfully get or it can be how many employees my company has numbers are going to follow you around everywhere what you can control is how your attachment to those numbers is uh, so i think that is something that youtube taught me on a very fundamental level makes sense yeah uh even i think nomsta and i have tried becoming youtube content creators <laughs> we're not very successful but we both love just making videos and, and having fun all the time so we do keep putting up videos on youtube 
not saying yeah. that we're anywhere close to your level <laughs> so okay but, that's the thing i think the one piece of advice i'd give for anybody who's trying to create a youtube channel is like create content people are searching for i also made youtube videos and my filmmaking style honestly hasn't changed that much i've just been looking at the people around me and trying to take in elements that i really love but the only reason i blew up was because people searched for a college decisions reaction or people searched how to get into stanford or people searched you know how do i get 98% board marks so all of my top performing videos are all that but then after a point in time after you give them enough reasons to come to your channel there'll be reasons to stay on your channel so there are two kinds of content one which brings people in and that's like the beginning of the funnel and then towards the end it's like oh but i also kind of like this person he's not a complete idiot so maybe i'll stick around to see what he eats in a day you know so i think that those are the two extremes but most people start with that most people will start with the vlogs they'll be like oh why is nobody watching my content i was like you know i had this thought as well and i was like oh wait sure and nobody cares about your life yet <laughs> and i said yeah because hopefully someday they could <laughs> makes sense so um i have a question for you uh, st- uh we all watched your college decisions video like o- automatically it wasn't even like oh we know shorya sada from shri ram or something it was just like it was so popular we all watched it but uh and we all and you didn't get into any of the ivs and you ended up getting into stanford so what do you think I think this kind of happens often. I don't know. You must know Arjun Pandey. Kind of happened with him. It's also. a very Stanford thing for yeah. some reason. Yeah. So, yeah. what do you think made you stand out to Stanford and the not the IVs? So, I think Stanford had the best taste. If I'm being honest with you, uh, that's the first thing I tell people. Uh, no, but I think like the real reason is that college decisions are like a crapshoot, and like you can never really control why you're going to get into a place and like where you're going to get in. uh from my experience and this might be completely incorrect but most stanford students had the same experience i, I did in the batch of 2024 i'd ask them oh how was your ivd they were like dude i didn't want to ex- open my stanford acceptance letter because i thought i wasn't going to get in because everyone just kept rejecting me uh so i think there's that to consider another thing to consider is that as indian international students uh it's it's statistical suicide like those are the two words i use every single time because it's true it's so hard for us to get in because whether you like it or not where international students when not the united states is priority uh private schools get the same amount of tuition from us than an in state student it makes sense to give them an acceptance like if we were india and all the ivy leagues were here or india would prioritize indians as well so it's not something that's unreasonable it's something that you just have to accept as you know a reality um and then i think the last thing also it just made me reflect on was that you can think you've done everything in the world in your extracurriculars maybe in your grades maybe in your testing but you can't control that outcome uh so i just all i knew is that stanford was my dream school so like i applied to stanford early as well and you know getting deferred from there was probably the best thing ever because like it made me like feel like it stanford had validated my application because stanford actually defers fewer people than they accept um and you know this happened to arjun as well but eventually when you get that acceptance and you realize you didn't want to go to yale you didn't want to go to harvard you didn't want to go to penn you only wanted to go to stanford then you're like okay why should i care if those guys you know rejected me so people ask me like how long do you spend thinking about the fact that you got into zero ivy leagues zero minutes i couldn't care less i am straight chilling at stanford right now <laughs> I think you would also mention that college fit is kind of a scam at 100% your video yeah, yeah. I sense. yeah I I think that students try to do too much to make themselves stand out to their dream school because they'll be like oh you know this college used this word on their website let me put that word in my application this is something that people have done like you can lie about it but I know you've done it because I've done it as well but I think that like their admissions officers know this. They know the words on their website. They know that everybody is trying to do the exact same thing and they're just looking for someone who they think will be a good fit on their campus. What Stanford saw in me that Harvard or any Ivy League didn't see, I will never know to be quite honest with me. They might not have liked the sound of my surname. Like I don't know. It's probably not that base a reason, but you know there there must be some fundamental reason. Uh but I think that applying early genuinely helped because Stanford read my application twice because of that. So that's a very practical tip I would give. If you really want to go somewhere, try and apply early. This is the case for most people. And also, COVID nineteen became quite a big deal towards the end of the application season uh, year that I was in. So a lot of admissions officers had to split. Not this isn't a justification by any means, but a lot of admissions officers had a lot of files to go through at a really quick rate. So the fact that Stanford had already seen my application just made things a lot easier for me. Uh, and I also. got the pm pradhan mantri bal shakti puraskar which helped i'm not going to deny its importance because people say that i don't mention it so now i've just decided to be upfront yes i am at the prime minister so did arjun pandey <laughs>
Yeah, so everyone knows you have extraordinary extracurriculars, but not everyone has such opportunities and not everyone is able to develop such extracurriculars. So do you still think such students stand a chance at say the top 20 universities in the US? And what are your tips for them? Yeah, so I think when it comes to extracurriculars, this is something that I think is unfair. A lot of people look at like my PM award and be like, oh yeah, that's the level of the extracurricular. But you have to understand that's only someone saying your extracurricular is good. Like that's validation for your extracurricular. What actually went into my extracurricular was like three years of trying to get somebody a job, trying to get a differently able individual a job with people saying no to me. That was literally what I did on a day-to-day -day basis. I went to a company be like, can you give this individual an opportunity? They'd interview them and then nothing would happen. So a lot of people tend to miss that effort. And I think a lot of people will try to recreate their extracurricular looking at the end point of your extracurricular, which is just the wrong way to go about it. I think that if you follow, you know, you follow the things you like, you pursue them for a long, a long period of time. And then eventually you look to scale your efforts up. So if you're creating maybe an entrepreneurial organization, if you're working in one city and your team is of five people, can you make five people, 15 people, 50 people, four cities, five cities, five countries? That scale is what's important because more than anything, it doesn't matter your end point. It matters where you started from and where you reached after starting. You're the growth that you've gotten because somebody with a lot of resources, like I'm not going to deny the fact that I was privileged. I went to a really good school in our country. A lot of students aren't like that. A lot of students might be from the state board. So seeing where you're starting from is very, very important because admissions officers are aware of it, but we as students don't take it into account as much. Your context, where you're coming from, your background, your parents' education, all of those things factor into the kind of resources that you have and the opportunities that you get. And universities are looking at how you're making the most of those opportunities. Because with your logic, there's a girl right now who's gotten in I don't know where exactly she's gone in from, but she's got a full scholarship from Harvard University. I think she's come out of her village um, from, I'm not, I think oh, it's Ranchi, Ranchi, right. Yes. Okay, exactly. So by by the logic that, you know, we, we tend to apply, an individual from that background should never have gotten into Harvard, but because of where they're coming from and how they've made the most of their opportunities, they've been given a chance. And I think that interestingly enough, if you're able to make the most out of scarce means, Universities see that as a sign that, oh, if they come to our university, imagine what they could do with our resources. It's like they would completely thrive over here. So I think that's that's the logic that we should start using. You know, how can we maximize the, the advantages we already have? Because everybody has their own unique opportunities, uh, whether it's the background of your parents, whether it's your friends, uh, you know, whether it's a school you're in, whether it's the subjects you're studying. So I think we have to start looking at our own opportunities and being like, you know, how can I maximize this versus looking at other people and being like, oh, he had this that I don't have. Because with that mindset, you know, I don't think you'd get anywhere. And I think uh, something that you said is also quite a human tendency to look at the destination that someone's reached without actually focusing on the journey that they've been through. That makes a lot of sense. I had uh, one other question for you. It was, uh, so a lot of people in our school also, we've seen our seniors thrive so much and do so much in such less time and, you know, just achieve so many things that we're also trying to do. So what is basically your drive? What drives you to do all of this? What drove you to actually, you know, put in so much time and effort to get disabled people, to get jobs, face all of those rejections and actually get to a point where you could say with pride that, you know, I finally got the Bal Puraskar because of all of those efforts and whatnot. Yeah, I really don't know. I feel like, you know, something that we hide from everybody and the, obviously this is the worst way to start an answer to such a nice question. But, you know, in the beginning, I was like, okay, you know, maybe it's college, maybe it's who I am. Because you can't, you can't deny the fact that college influences you a little bit. Like it's a variable that's there. But during my gap year, I've still been doing things. So now I'm just like, okay, I don't need to get into any college. Why am I doing these things? And I think that it, for me, it's always been a, fundamental desire to do things differently. I've always had that approach. Like if somebody is doing ABC, I'll be like, okay, how can I do Z with this? Um, and whether it's a startup, I'll be like, okay, how can I impact people in the most unique way possible? Uh, whether it's, you know, with my YouTube channel, I'm trying to look at, okay, how can I make content pieces that are completely different from one another? So I think if you try to do things differently and I've, I've always tried to stay away from the norm and try to do new things, that desire just kept pushing me. And I think, this is true for a lot of people. Once you see a little amount of success, it motivates you a lot, whether you, you know, accept that or deny that. So I'd say that instead of focusing on big wins, just focus on small, small wins every single day. So even if you see a lot of failures, I think it's really important to keep yourself going with the fact that, oh, you know, one company replied to my cold email today. And 
And that just kept fueling me and kept pushing me forward. And as for probably the source of my motivation, because these are all things obviously as a result of my motivation, but I think that the way I was brought up and the, the parents that I had, uh, I'd attributed completely to them. I think just like the life lessons they taught me, um, the value they imbibed in me of a higher education, I've always been aware of it. And I've always known that I need to make every, like I need to make the most of every moment I have because it's going to contribute to this eventual end goal. And I made sure it wasn't a toxic relationship. Like I, I honestly, like people ask me, how did you feel the day you got ejected from all the Ivy Leagues? I was pretty sad for like an hour, maybe two hours. And then after that, I just accepted it because I think that, you know, for me, it was more of applying sideways. And this is like a logic that there's an admissions officer at, at MIT who says this a lot, but he says that if you do things because you love them and then, you know, you achieve success with them, you're a good student, you're a good person and you get into college because of that, you're not getting into college because you wanted to get into college, you're getting into college as a virtue of all these great things. And if you don't get into a good college, then you still have all those great things. So this idea of, you know, trying to be a good student, trying to be a good person, trying to have good extracurriculars, they're for your personal development, not for any college's growth. Because the fact of the matter is that today the bar is set so high that universities are accepting already successful students, churning out even more successful students, and then taking credit for that success. When in reality, most of the high school students entering these institutions are already going to change the world regardless of where they go they're just those kinds of people so i think that you know those are a few things to keep in mind i know you initially asked about motivation i took a whole spiral it tends to happen with my youtube channel a lot as well but yeah i think that's my that's my i think those are the best kinds of conversations so that's okay yeah the branch absolutely i think speaking of your youtube channel uh, you have this video i think you uploaded two weeks ago where you shared 19 lessons that you learned throughout your 19 years of existence. And mm -hmm. I have this uh, playlist called uh, videos to get me through life. And that's the first video on that. So those are the that's only videos I turn to ever uh, whenever I'm feeling down. So that's crazy. in that video, particularly you talked about how uh, you stop, you stop wondering about uh, things that could pos possibly have a chain of, you know, uh, have a chain of chain reactions so that, you know, you stop overthinking and you just uh, look at trailers and just stop yourself there and reconsider everything. Um, so how did you come to realize this? Because a lot of high school YouTubers and college YouTubers get a lot of hate for, you know, uh, being entitled and, you know, um, having privilege and whatnot. And with the entire community piling up on you, it's, it's kind of difficult to, you know, just focus on what you're creating. So how did you re come to realize that this could be a potential solution to that? Uh, the, the overthinking solution as, as to the hate. Oh yeah. yeah. So two different aspects. One is the whole hate aspect. Uh, I can't possibly say that hate is not warranted, even though it's quite small in its nature, saying that I'm privileged. It's, I mean, it's a fact, right? I can't do much about it. I can't be like, no, that's not true. Like I've definitely, I have more resources than the average person. I'm not going to deny it. What I do say is that I made the most of my privilege. Like you can have another privileged kid living in Delhi or, or in Gurgaon and they might not be doing anything with that time versus me trying to, you know, make the most of it, not put anybody else down. This like a hypothetical person. Hopefully they don't exist. But um, with the whole overthinking thing, that was something I just learned because of like anxiety, because I experienced it for a period of time. And I would always try to figure out how to solve it. And I realized that it was just like a small spiral that always leads down. And I feel like a lot of students face anxiety, but they don't call it anxiety because it's a very Indian thing to do. But your parents will be like, no, no, don't call it that. Because if you call it that, then it becomes even more real, right? Because like, you know, if someone, if someone is suffering from, you know, maybe like a lung disease, be like, no, no, don't call it that disease. It's not, you know, it's not that. Just deny it and then act like it never existed. But so I was like, okay, no, it is anxiety. I am experiencing this. And then I had to like sort of extrapolate and be like, okay, what is causing this? And I realized it was just overthinking one thought leads to another thought leads to another thought. And I'm obsessed with films. So I was like, okay, like just, you have to detach yourself from whatever thought you're having. And you just have to observe it from a distance because only then you realize how, you know, stupid that idea is like genuinely stupid because when you're in that first person perspective, it's very hard to, you know, be emotional uh, like rational about it and logical about it and honestly i still struggle with this from a day-to-day -day basis even yesterday i made us like i had a stupid chain reaction of a thought um sorry i should not be saying stupid over here uh even though that's the most pg-13 abuse i could have chosen uh but yeah so if you observe your thoughts from a distance i honestly think that it becomes a lot easier to, to stop something like a, a reaction. Uh, and I use, so for anybody who hasn't seen that video, I didn't give any context whatsoever, but my biggest solution for overthinking is that just act as if you're sitting in a theater 
and a thought that's coming into your head is like a movie trailer and when you watch a movie trailer in the theater you're like man should i watch this movie or not like it looks kind of good the actors are kind of good but sometimes you're like yo that's terrible i will never watch this movie in my life the same way you should treat your thoughts if you see a thought that's entering and just entering you should judge whether it's a thought you should invest your time into or not invest your time into and although that's really hard to do in the beginning i think the more and more you do it your mind is also more capable than you think and it eventually can do it it's like saying that oh meditate for just 2 minutes a day eventually you'll be able to meditate for 30 minutes a day or 40 minutes a day it's it's a learning process and it's a slow process uh, but yeah that's my thing on on hate and and anxiety wonderfully put thank you so much I I don't think I've ever heard anyone talk about anxiety or like a solution to anxiety like that so that's no yeah sorry. and like honestly it's so strange because like I always thought that like I'd never get it like I won't go into what caused it because that's something else altogether uh be careful of the relationships you choose but uh <laughs> in essence I think that it's yeah it, for me it was all about accepting the fact that you can get anxiety and that your mental health is not as strong as you think sometimes a lot of people think that only weak people get it or only a certain kind of person can have anxiety or depression because something about them is inferior or something about them is weak and i know this because my friends have said this um people in my grade have said this everybody around us says this all the time they might not even say it but they do think it but only when you experience it yourself you can really realize that it can happen to anybody and once you realize that then i think everybody should put collective effort into thinking about how to solve it uh, and different things work for everyone to be honest i use the movie trailer analogy someone else might use a different analogy it's very personalized uh, but i think that again talking to people about it your parents about it preferably because they're a lot more experienced than you and they know what's best uh, if you can if that as supportive and kind um, then i think those are a few good solutions so i'll just go to the rapid fire questions for now So there are a few questions. Just answer honestly. I think you've been doing that for a while. So yeah. Too yeah. honestly, in my opinion. <laughs> okay. So the first question is: Describe yourself in three words. People already know the three words I choose: sleep deprived, dream of. That's not a, pl- a plug for my company, but I'm still using those three words because they're my favorite three words. Makes sense. If you could meet one person, alive or dead, who would it be? That's a really good question. Hmm. 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 I I want to meet Christopher Nolan alive. Makes sense. Okay. What is one interesting thing that you own? What I own? I'm looking around my room because I honestly don't know. Uh I have a I have a skateboard like a, a mini rubber skateboard. It's not an interesting thing but a student of my school when I was head boy a sixth grader in my school gave it to me for helping him with a particular problem he had at home. So I I keep that skateboard with me all the time it's on my desk. That's one thing that's I like. That's very sweet. That's very sweet. What is the lowest grade you've ever received? Mm, that's an interesting yeah 72 yeah 70 70s mein kuch aaye the i don't know what it is my by the way my report card is there for the entire internet to see in my stats video and i went into my analytics just out of curiosity and youtube tells you what percentage of the audience was there at what point in time 95% of the people were there during that one second of my report card showing after that all of them disappeared after that it's like 70% 60% 50% but no 95% for that one report card showing so it's very reflective of how we do half of them are probably indian parents so yeah. <laughs> god that is something about you that you'd like to change oh definitely the overthinking bit i overthink way too much uh and i feel like lying to myself and rationalizing i think all of us are kind of guilty to, of this but like and the worst part is when you lie to yourself it's very hard to catch it because you convince yourself also you're not lying to yourself it's like the liar telling the person who's being lied to then hey, you're not telling a lie what are you doing you're fine you're good uh so i think being more aware of what oh, i am really doing something that's relatable i think when's the last time you did something for the first time and what was it it's a really good question i ask that question to everybody i meet uh So last time I did something for the first time. Uh, well, as of one month ago, I cut coffee in my life for thirty days. That's the last time I did something for the first time. Uh, I tried yoga out, but that was a while ago. I tried boxing, MMA, mixed martial arts. I've been doing that for about six months. Even though it doesn't look like, I understand live stream viewers, but I did it. Uh, yeah, I think those are three things. Last time I did something. I think uh, context. I actually predicted that you would say the coffee answer. Yeah, actually, so, really that. Uh, to be see in in COVID, there's not that much interesting stuff happening in my life. Now, so yeah, yeah, he gets it. When was uh, okay? Which is your favorite TV show? Who? Okay, 
the tv show i watched the most is modern family i think there is you cannot beat modern family it's better than every sitcom in the world friends doesn't friends doesn't stand a chance you can't even fight me on this uh an, an interesting tv show i like a lot is master of none by aziz ansari that's one i watch a lot uh and somebody feed phil whenever i'm hungry i watch sorry i think you're my detached uh, twin brother because right right before you entered i was telling uh, nomi about how i love modern family decent it's theater. too good it's, it's too, too good, good. It's too good. It's too good. It's too it's overpowered yeah exactly see someone agrees with me okay cool that, now i don't care about anybody who disagrees i've got one on my side yeah that's that's perfect i have to i still have to watch it i have to watch you it. haven't so, also the you when you see this family three families grow together as people throughout these seasons you will like you will want to be those family members i'm telling you for a fact like i i generally she hasn't seen the like, office she hasn't seen the office i'm just going to lay that see out. okay office is acceptable because with the first season it's quite bland but born family from the first episode is really good so if you don't have the patience wait sure have you seen how i met your mother by any chance i haven't that's a show i haven't seen you have to watch it it will be yeah. one because you love even more you're not missing anything i won't fret <laughs> oh my god <laughs> Yeah. Did I say anything about modern family? I'm kidding. Yeah, she was quite nice. She was quite nice about it. I'll watch it. I'll keep it. <laughs> so I think I think there are two people supporting how I met your mother. Even Div, he also really likes it. So yeah, yeah. you should get to that. And the last question: Who's your biggest inspiration? Who? Oh uh, yeah. I mean, if it's not a surprise, my parents, my mom and dad, for different reasons. My mom for my my dad for like. hard work persistence uh and having the value of ambition and my mom for being really optimistic and cheerful if i only had one of them in my life i think i'd self combust because too much of any of these sides is really really dangerous uh, but i think since both of them are there i think it balances out to make one shot as an her this mean, you know was kind of visible in your video also right like a lot of uh, comments were flooded by how you support how supportive your parents were actually of yeah. your rejection and what not so it's something that the something. world noticed yeah definitely <laughs> you know, just like why aren't these indian parents slapping him for not getting into college and i was like that doesn't happen in this household it's yeah, not people... documenting in the making <laughs> child of you that's that's true a lot of people don't expect it but i think that uh, it some in, a lot of indian parents are a lot nice so then we give them credit for it. some are better at showing it some are worse at showing it my parents are quite you know quite showy showy with it and they love the camera and never bring it out also uh, but yeah do appreciate them for thank that. god for that you know it's your youtube channel is thriving yeah exactly dude i don't even know what i'm going to do with youtube when i go to stanford and get hit with a tough load of work all of the things i'm doing in my gap i have no clue how i'll sustain them uh, i'm sure yeah. i'm sure you watch rp park that's I'm, true he man uploads once in 8 months <laughs> and he played right but every video every video he uploads is amazing i that's I, true that's I, true not all of them I yeah. think so, there's something with Stanford and YouTube for some reason I think in my opinion Stanford just tends to pick like some kind of people that have like similar wavelengths because i like when i watch rp video i like relate to it on a spiritual level sometimes and i think a lot of stanford youtubers emit the same energy and even if you look at the class of 2025 a lot of us are quite like i don't know very high energy and to cutlet kind of people uh but i don't know it's i think stanford's doing something maybe they call up all the other I... ivy leagues being like reject this kid for taking <laughs> I almost as like California love but for some reason it's just true some, some true. binding force I'm a very west coast person and actually so I was born in Singapore and I'm not a Singaporean citizen because like I uh, you have to serve in the army if you're a Singaporean citizen my parents were just like please no we want to keep a kid uh but then I went to the US and I stayed in California I stayed in San Jose and I've been to Stanford's campus and then when I was about 4 or 5 years old I came back to India so I think going back to Stanford's sort of like this wholesome full circle moment for for me Uh, so that's nice. I don't know why I mentioned that, but you know, I thought it should be there. <laughs> it, it's actually helpful. One thing that I'd really like to know is not there in the question list or anything, but like one story that maybe change your life in some way, something that's happened to you, or just some really fun story that I think we'd all enjoy. Anything that you'd want to tell, any experience that you'd you'd want to go back and have have it all over again, something like that. An experience I'd like to have all over again. Mm hmm. I think making my very first film was a story that I liked a lot. So I think I, I, some people know this, but I had gone to an NGO that basically helps specially able children. And because I had grown up in a in a city like Gurgaon, there was a very different idea of differently abled and like disabled children. Uh, so like you, they wouldn't be in the same classroom as you. You wouldn't understand. You know. like what was wrong in specific like nobody knew in 5th grade and 6th grade and people would be insensitive as well but when i went to that ngo i think one as a filmmaker i just picked up a phone camera put it on the selfie stick and started recording people and i didn't realize the potential of that but i just did it and 
I think now when I look back on it, if I never took that first step and I never, you know, experienced that one foundation as a volunteer, I wouldn't have made a company that literally give, like had at some point in time given jobs. So I think that, you know, the point of that is that in hindsight, it's very easy to see how things line up. It's very easy to be like, oh yeah, this guy created a company before that. He was a filmmaker before that. He was a volunteer. But in reality, all three of those things are so far apart in the logic of happening one after the other. So I think that whenever you're starting something out, a lot of people are like, oh, what can this become? You know, what's the end point? You're not going to see it. So many unexpected things are going to happen to you. Like if you're doing anything right now, just ask yourself, where was I in the same thing two years ago? And you'll be in a completely different position from where you started. So I think that's one thing that, you know, don't worry about the future as much. Um, look at where look at where you're starting from, take it one day at a time. And I'm sure a lot of things will happen to you uh, along the way. I think we've come to the end of this interview. I really sure. want to, yeah, yeah, I wanted it to last longer, but do any of you have any other questions? Like I have a solid 10, 15 minutes more. Uh, I don't know why I blocked out this much time, but today is actually like a really packed day. <laughs> so I was just like, okay, let's start off fun and then we'll do work stuff. I actually did have a question before we logged off. Uh, like how, how do you deal with failure? Because Kobe, I, I actually heard Kobe Bryant talk about failure and that just gave me a complex because the man says a uh, failure doesn't exist and it's a figment, figment of your imagination and whatever. I can't relate to that because I definitely feel uh, the pressure and the weight actually bringing me down uh, when I fail. So how do you actually process failure and how do you deal with such? You'd be surprised. With my, my answer was the exact same without hearing, without hearing what you said about Kobe Bryant. Like I, I'll tell you why I think like that, but uh, like I used to be like, I used to be kind of worried. I'd be like, oh, somebody asks me what my biggest failure is. I don't really have an answer to it. And I was thinking, I was like, okay, does that mean I didn't have any struggles? I'm like, no, I did have struggles. Because I was like, okay, does that mean that I haven't had any weak, like moments of actual poor performance? I was like, no, I have had moments of poor performance. But the thing is, in hindsight, I always tend to look at them as like one step towards becoming the person I am today. And for that, I don't look at it as a failure. Like, I will never look at my college rejections as a failure. I will never look at my bad grades as a failure. Because there was always this one thing that I could have done better that led to that failure. And some things are obviously things out of your control, but whenever it's something that you've done wrong yourself, for me, it's always a moment of looking inwards and being like, what could I have done differently? For academics, it's always discipline for me. I'm like, if you were a little more disciplined, you know, this would have gone right. Or if you were a little more disciplined, that would have gone right. That's something I fundamentally, be fundamentally believe in. Like discipline leads to freedom in any, any field whatsoever, whether that's YouTube, whether that's content creation, entrepreneurship, anything. Um, and also with failure, I think, uh, Extreme ownership is something I've also come to believe in. So holding yourself accountable for anything that goes wrong. But at the same time, the other thing I also say is that one failure shouldn't negate like years of work that you've put in or years of like good things that you've done. It doesn't take away from the person who you are. It's just added a new layer to it. Uh, I think people see, uh, people see like yourself as like, uh, like a like a Lego tower structure. Whenever you do something bad, like you knock off like half of that tower structure, you're just adding another block. Except that block is just of a different nature. So it doesn't, you know. I don't know why I came up with that analogy right now. I hope that I hope you understood. Um, but yeah, it's it's adding on to the person you are rather than taking away from it. But don't you think like extreme ownership? I, I definitely get uh, what you say about uh, how failures can actually help you develop, but. Don't you think extreme ownership for some people can be counterproductive uh, because some people can, you know, really uh, actually, you That's know, true. Their body, actually. I think moderation is key for everything, even though in terms of a lot of things I take it to an extreme, I think as a person, you should like moderation is key. Like no normal person quits coffee for 30 days. You can, you could have just reduced your coffee shop. Yeah. But the, the point is that if you hold yourself accountable you don't hold yourself accountable for a moth breathing on the wall like you hold yourself accountable for things where you're truly accountable and other than that you let things be um i think that being kinder to yourself is something i've also learned the hard way throughout high school uh like and this is advice everybody gives but i still give it because it's so important like whenever i'm talking to my friend i'm like okay how would i how would this person treat me how would i treat this person if they came to me with the same problem versus how would i treat myself there's a stark difference between how you treat yourself and how you treat like your best friend who has the exact same problem as you because you just tend to be a lot kinder to another person versus yourself uh so i think that that's one thing that i've tried to do 
and honestly it's it's something that's built out of practice like if you if you're hard on yourself today you'll be hard on yourself tomorrow you're going to keep doing that but you have to stop the chain reaction at some point uh, so i think you know taking like a rest day or a rest hour is always okay like sometimes i'll waste the middle portion of my day and like the first half my day was super productive maybe the afternoon half was really bad and then i have like the night portion and i always tell myself okay the day is not over you can still work really hard in the night and still be okay with how you've done uh, so i think that you know also not giving up on yourself is really important it's very easy for us to let ourselves slip and be like oh yaar one hour went on instagram that's make the whole day about this or oh it's 10:43 i was going to study at 10:45 but now it's 10:46 so i'll wait till 11 o'clock you don't let yourself slip that easily these are things that every student is guilty of um, but i think that you know if you just hold catch yourself like and also not everybody is going to catch you don't expect other people to catch you you have to catch yourself at a point in time stop yourself from going down a slippery slope uh, and i think you should be in a good place on a personal level i think uh, what you're talking about is actually uh, similar to how i feel about uh, spirituality because spirituality can help you a uh, moderate yourself uh, you know according to what you actually want in life and how it can also uh, let you you know help yourself help yourself become more accountable for your actions alone so would you consider yourself a spiritual person you talked about ha- uh, being uh, habituated yeah. to you know doing yoga or something and yeah. even the college de- reactions video i think your uh, mom put sticker on your uh, head before yeah. you yoga so that's my parents religious status <laughs> uh, which for most indians is quite evidently known uh, right but i think yeah i'm quite a strong believer in faith i think optimism and faith go hand in hand uh, but it's all about your locus of control like that's a very psychological word and an example but locus of control basically means that for for some spiritual people like look your locus of control can be outside of yourself as in everything you attribute to like an external source like if you do well tomorrow it's because of like some source of god religion whatever you want to attribute it to versus well as if you have like an internal locus of control what you do is a direct result your results are a direct result of your uh, actions um messed up statement sorry i've been talking for a bit uh, but basically you're accountable for yourself but i think that the idea of faith with an internal locus of control does is a very interesting combination because even though you'll hold yourself accountable you still recognize that that result is still out of your control and you can after putting in as much effort as possible the result is out of your hands like that's the one thing i've been brought up on like put in as much effort as you can into something but after that you have to detach yourself from the result because any extraneous variable can you know knock it out uh and you can't hold yourself accountable in those instances um so i think that's sort of my relationship with the spirit with spirituality it's very caveated like it'll be like this but not this this but not this like you should be optimistic but you also should be realistic and i think that that you know that's like a a, a tug of war that everybody is super confused about like how do i manage both but you still have to do it um so i think like optimistic without getting too like dreaming but not having too ambitious dreams um you know laughing all the time but not taking yourself like you know not being too light about the world like there's so many different tug of wars that all of us as students do on a day to day basis uh, but i still think that they're very important because you need to be in moderated you can't just pull up rope and freaking fling it to the other side of the world i think i had another question it's a basic one i think you'll bring your philosophy into it with pretty cool but uh, i wanted to know how you came up with the idea of sleep deprived dreamers like did you always have a knack for teaching or was it just youtube videos that you'd wanted to convert into something bigger and better or something like that yeah i always wanted like my own platform off of youtube because as any creator and this is sort of like business one on one advice cuz enough of philosophy but you can't be dependent on one source for all of your income all of your content or anything for that matter uh, so you have to diversify in some shape and form and as a content creator you can you also need to diversify so either i could have made instagram reels which was unacceptable to me at that point in time and to a certain extent still is right now uh, but on the other end of the things i could have made my own platform created my own program and sold that program for a certain amount of value so i realized that that was something that was a lot more acceptable and also if you look at how students learn youtube is it's a great place to learn but there are ways you can improve it uh, you know making a more structured learning environment not having constant directions you know left and right uh, and also monetarily i was a fundamental be- believer in the fact that if i traveled in my gap year this is naive october 2020 <laughs> sure i'm talking but i was like yeah i'm going to go to italy but i'm going to pay for my own trip so i was like okay how do i fund myself for this gap year and then possibly four years of college as well like i really want to do that i still want to do that i want to pay for myself but uh, that's when i this the idea of sleep deprived dreamers came in and i think with a lot of 18 year olds today or with our generation today it's almost unacceptable to earn money or charge a value for anything like there are so many times and nonstop will relate to this on a spiritual 
unreliable but someone will ask you to make a film for you and refuse to pay you because they're like oh film to banana hai ya editing to karni hai and this is especially true for creative fields because people don't put a monetary value on it because they think you don't deserve to be paid and you have to be quite especially your friends your friends will ask you to edit something and yes you will do it but it takes a lot of time to do it um but the point being i'd wanted to see if i could monetize this in some shape and form so i created sleep to drive dreamers but now with what i'm doing with sleep to drive dreamers is that i'm trying to genuinely find the best college students across the world and get them to create their own programs and norms that knows this cuz i literally interviewed her on this like two days ago or yesterday um but the goal is that you know high school students today are doing so much more than they are capable of they are starting companies they are uh, creating their own books they are writing their own music and publishing it on spotify they are creating music videos they are writing research papers and today's high school students are doing things that 20 years ago no adult would ever have thought of doing period but the idea is that when all of us get into college we kind of forget where we've come from we forget the kind of work that we've put in and we forget all of the lessons that we have and because of my youtube channel i was able to share some of those lessons and i also realized people find them valuable so there's so many other college students like me who've also written research papers who've also published books that could create courses on sleep to drive dreamers about those aspects of the college application process that other students could learn from so the way i th- think of it is like a skill share or a master class for high school students that's focused on skill development like all of these things that only adults do that you're left to navigate yourself somebody else can guide you through that entire journey um so that's that's the goal now i i have another follow up question this is one question i've been asking around a lot of people who are getting into like business and all of that cuz i've been focusing a lot on my creative aspects and overlooking a lot of the business stuff and how much i should price myself or how much you know i should ask people to pay me and i think that is one question that a lot of the budding creatives get confused with like how do you know what your worth is how much do you charge someone so how did you come to figure out what you should be charging for sleep deprived teamers i know that's a little more academic so you yeah. uh, take a charge of that like that but yeah with uh, creativity it's a little difficult to understand what your value is what your worth is definitely i think that like if you go online and search you know how much i should charge for sponsorships there's like a formula that they give you i think it's you know per 1000 view like how many views you're getting on average so if that's 10000 views you divide it by something you multiply it by 100% you get a figure whatever the thing is people aren't going to give you that figure in a lot of cases uh, so you know i've had companies approach me and they're like trying to get me for sponsorships but they undervalued me and if i don't believe in their value i don't take their money as simple as that as like a content creator that's my fundamental belief like nobody has seen an actual sponsorship on my channel so far where i've put an actual ad like even the skillshare sponsorship i did i was giving a free account of skillshare from my own pocket um skillshare didn't endorse me even though people thought that which honestly is pretty cool like i'm fine with you thinking that uh, but it came out of my own pocket but i think that um for valuing yourself as a creator it's it's very hard and i always look left and right so if there are other creators in my space with a similar subscriber count with a similar view count i tend to ask them what they did because there's no one size fits all also in india you get paid a lot less in the us i think that's another thing to take into account how different geographies affect it which shouldn't i mean it shouldn't be the case for creativity but because the standard of, of standard of living is different in different countries even youtube pays creators in india so much lesser um than they pay you know you like creators in the us uh, and as for sleep to drive dreamers i just looked at my competition and said okay can i make something 150th of that so i looked at private councils i was like great how do i undercut this by like uh, like a 100th or a 50th uh, and i was acceptable with that that being said i did get flack initially for having like a 200 dollar course but then i knew in the value of the course and i wasn't forcing anybody to buy it like if someone wants to purchase it it's their own money um i give refunds to people who are not satisfied with the course although i haven't had that scenario as of yet and also do something charitable if you can so for every one student who purchases my course i give a scholarship to someone from a rural region i've had kids from all over the world from like literally colombia to saudi arabia there was a kid from kashmir who took the course who was talking to me about you know how life is living over there so i think that as long as you're doing something meaningful as well and you're helping kids impacting kids i'm giving knowledge at the end of the day it's not you know it's not like a product you use that's going to make you look prettier or something like it's something that is going to have actual utility in your life not that beauty products don't have utility different conversation sorry overthinking you see um but yeah i think that's what i would say that's a pretty good answer i think it's time to actually get to work and look up stuff and do something good with my life as well a lot of people can relate around <laughs> for sure yeah so so i think we've reached the end of this interview uh thank you so much everybody for tuning in 
uh thank you shorya for coming and actually supporting our cause we're trying to help people get resources during this under very under resourced time people are not able to find oxygen concentrators not able to find ventilators and beds for their family members so we're trying to help that cause trying to raise money so that we can get them for them individually get them for them to them yeah so make sure you donate from the uh, from the link in our description box below and just thank you for being here shorya thank you so much for having me over guys it is a pleasure to be here it's a pleasure to contribute to this cause and i know you guys have already raised quite a substantial sum so congratulations on that as well i think your school's doing a fundamentally uh, insane job uh, and yeah keep pushing ahead thank you so much thank you bye thank you bye guys have a great bye. day thank you bye, bye.